So I'm going to start this talk by um, telling you vaguely about a problem. Um, I won't give any of the details, uh, but hopefully it'll be enough to pique your interest. And um, so then I'll try to explain what and why and how, and what is the context and how do you go about solving it. So here's, um, here's what I want to tell you about. I want to tell you about random knots. So here are some random knots. Um, in the cube, the way I constructed these is by um, picking completely random points in the cube in order and then connecting them um, with line segments. So um, that gives you some random curve. It may or may not be knotted. Um, this one is not knotted, as you can see. And um, so these are just some examples. This one has eight vertices. Um, this one has 16 vertices. Um, and actually, I didn't make these. I stole them from a guy named Chaim Evan Zohar. So thank you to him. Um, but so the, these are the objects that I'm going to be working with. And the question I want to ask is something like this. If you want to stretch a cloth over this random knot, so something right like what is that cloth going to look like well maybe it's sort of you stretch it over this triangle and then you stretch it over this other um, this triangle in the back so something like this right and then it also goes over this little thing in the front. Um, so you, you can do it somehow, right? You can think of this as a cloth or of a, like a soap bubble, like you took this frame and you dipped it in a bucket of soap and what comes out. Um, and the question is how much cloth or how much soap, what is the area that you need to fill it in most efficiently? Um, and there's an answer. The answer is if n is the number of vertices, so here it's eight, here it's 16, the total area is usually going to be proportional to square root of n log n. And right, the word usually um, is doing some work here because, um, right, this is a random thing. And sometimes you're going to do badly. But usually, it's about square root of n log n. Um, OK. So I want to tell you sort of what is the context for problems like this, and then what exactly are the parameters, right? What do I mean by stretching a cloth? Um, what do I mean by usually? And then maybe a little bit about how you would go about actually solving this problem. So this all falls under the rubric of huh? Um, and, and so I want to start you off with an extremely old problem. This, this problem was one that the ancient Greeks already thought about. Um, and it, it's so natural that quite possibly other non-Western cultures also thought about it. So if you've heard of something like that, please let me know. I'd be very interested in finding out. Um, but the problem is just take the plane um, and take a curve, take a string of length P um, and try to enclose the uh, biggest possible area with it, right? You can sort of make different shapes with your string. And right, how, how do you 
and close area in the most efficient possible way. And it's not that hard to guess that the answer is going to be that the best you can do is a circle, right? And so therefore, right, in that case, the perimeter is 2 pi times the radius, and the area is pi r squared, right, which is, um, if you substitute this first equation, we get pi times p over 2 pi squared, and that's p squared over 4 pi, right? So if you're asking just about the largest area, then the answer is it's p squared over 4 pi, where p is the, the length of your string. Um, and so the, this is something that's a very easy to guess. The, the Greeks already guessed it, and they sort of proved it, but they, they just proved that the sphere was better than any polygon. And so what if you have a different smooth, sorry, the circle is better than, than any polygon. Um, so what if you have some other smooth circle, a smooth curve, really not doing very well with words right now. Um, well, the, the Greeks didn't really have an idea of like what other smooth curves are there. I guess there are ellipses, but they, they didn't have a general theory or anything. Um, and so along came the 19th century, right? And people really wanted to, that, that's when rigorous math was really being developed and people um, wanted to solve the problem. And in the 1850s, um, a guy named Jakob Steiner uh, almost solved it. He showed that if there's a best curve, then it has to be the circle. Uh, but he didn't show that there actually has to be a best curve. So that, that took another few decades. Uh, but by now, there are a lot of proofs of the statement. Um, and by the way, Steiner's argument is incredibly beautiful. It has nothing to do with anything else I'm going to talk about, but I was still very tempted to tell you about it. But ultimately, I decided that it would be a distraction. Um, instead, right, so th this, is, this is hard to prove. And so instead, I want to tell you something that's easy to prove. And that's, right, so there, there are two parts to this formula that there's the one over four pi and there's the p squared. And I want to argue that the p squared is actually really easy to see. So it's easy to see that the optimal area, um, the, the largest area enclosed in a curve of length p has to be of the form cp squared for some constants, right? And that just comes from the fact that in the plane, we can scale things. So let's say we just know the optimal shape with perimeter one, um, and let's call that shape s. Well, we can build, we can scale it up and get a shape ps, right? This is p times s um, with, so the, this has perimeter, one, so this shape has perimeter P, right? So, and let's say, um, the area of S is C, right? It's some constant. That means that the area of P times S is, CP squared and the perimeter of P times S is P, right? And, um, and I, I want to argue that P times S, that, that if S is optimal um, with perimeter one, has the biggest area with perimeter one, 
then P times S has the biggest area with perimeter P. Um, Um, and why is that? Well, suppose you had something with bigger area. So if you had a shape with bigger area, you could scale it down. and get a better shape with perimeter one. Right, so, so that's it. That component of the proof was very easy. And it, now this is a matter of mathematical taste, but the sort of mathematician that I am um, I tend to not really care about exact constants. Um, instead, I care about how things scale as they get bigger. And so we can start asking the same sort of question in lots of different contexts, right? This, this is one way that mathematicians come up with new problems. They say, okay, here's an old problem that I know how to solve. Let's now tweak it a bit and, and come up with a new problem that we don't yet know how to solve. And so one way of coming up with a new problem related to this is to say, okay, we did it in 2D, what about 3D? And in 3D, there are two possible generalizations you can have. Um, so one is you could say, okay, now instead of the perimeter, I have Instead of a, a region with a perimeter, I have a region with surface area. So what is the largest volume that can be enclosed in a surface area, in a surface with surface area A, right? And surprise, surprise, the best thing you can do is the sphere, right? And, um, but again, that's a little hard to prove. And the easy thing to prove is, um, if we scale by X, right, then surface area, so if we scale our shape by X, surface area scales by X squared and volume scales by X cubed. And so um, that means that the overall, Right, the volume as a function of surface area um, the the optimal volume is going to be some constant times a to the three halves by the same exact proof that we had here. So that, that's one of the possible generalizations. Um, here's another one. What about the area enclosed by a curve, right? So now, now we have to be a little careful about what the question is, because in 3D, if you take a curve, right? He, here's my purple curve. It's just a flat circle in a plane, right? And I can fill it in lots of different ways. I can just fill it in with a flat disc. I can fill it in with a hemisphere. I can fill it in with a giant blob with a neck, right? These are all legal surfaces. And so we can't just say, right, what is the largest area that can be enclosed in a surface because the area of this blob can be as big as you want. So that's not a very interesting question. Um, so here's how we actually want to phrase the question. 
right? For a given curve, we actually want to take the smallest area, right? So like, if we want to say the circle is hard to fill, right? Well, even the smallest area surface that fills it in is pretty big, right? So given a closed curve, um, we can define fill of C to be the smallest area of a surface filling it in, right? So in this case, for this flat circle, it's, let's say it has perimeter one, then the area to fill it in is going to be um, P squared, or I guess one over four pi. Um, Right, and the question we actually want to ask is, over all different curves, what is the biggest fill C, right? What is the hardest curve to fill, right? How hard to fill is the hardest to fill curve? This is what's called a minimax problem, right? You're actually taking a max of a bunch of mins, right? A maximum of a bunch of minima. And the answer, somewhat anticlimactically, is it's still p squared over 4 pi, right? That even if you're allowed three dimensions, so you're, you're allowed curves that, um, that don't live in a plane, right? So the, this is a bendy circle that you can fill in with this sort of saddle shape, right? The, the hardest to fill one is still gonna be a flat circle. Um, and again, this is hard to show, but again, the, the scaling question is gonna be easy, right? You, you know that it's something times P squared. So, we're plagued by <laughs> these questions that are too easy, right? How can we generalize this problem further so that it's no longer an incredibly easy question? Um, and that there are two directions you can go. One idea is you ask the same question, but now you go outside of Euclidean space and you go to hyperbolic space or you go to some kind of um, infinite tree or some, a Cayley graph, graph of a group, if you know what that is, and you ask the question there, and there are lots of interesting and beautiful answers. There's lots of beautiful math that goes in that direction, and I have also contributed a little bit to that direction, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Instead, the, the direction I'm going to go is instead of asking about the max, I'm going to ask what happens for a random curve. And so the next um, part of the talk is going to be about making this question that I started talking about before precise. <laughs>